All right. So uh, I'll start this panel discussion with uh, the edu education system, and my first question is goes to Rek. So Rek, um, how do you assess the present condition of EdTech in terms of uh, information security and technology advancement? Do you think uh, these are essential for improving the data security? Yeah, Rek. Yeah, so you know, in, in um, education, uh, uh, technology has a, you know advanced, and there's been a lot of uh, changes. Uh, security, I think, has lagged behind quite a bit. Um, you know, it's it's not it hasn't gone really at the same pace, and so I think there are some key focuses that that we need to um, be thinking about. One is um, you know data and and you know data security, right? Uh, how we encrypt things, how we provide access control, how do we, um, you know, um, provide the right access uh, to the individuals. Um, second, I think we need to think about privacy um, as by design, right? Yeah. Making sure that um, data is only accessible to the individuals they really need access and only the minimal set of data. And I think we've, we've done a um, good job on that side at NYU. Um, and then, Security awareness and security training, I think that really we're not thinking enough about it. Uh, even thinking about uh, uh, just simple MFA, we're all probably using, everybody raise your hand if you're using MFA. Now, right. did you know that there's like 10 different ways of, of using MFA, right? There's different devices, different ways. There's, some of them are less secure. Uh, we have uh, actually turned off phone calls because we felt that was very insecure. We're mitigating for some applications, as SMS and, and other ways. So, so you just you have to make the uh, community and everyone aware um, of the, you know, of the security and how to utilize the security. All right, thank you. So my next question is to Sanjay. Yep. So as a CTO of Student Aid Commission in California, right? So with your experience in integration technology into the public sector of education systems. How does the current state of education unders underscore the critical needs for integration transformation? So uh, in states like California, um, whether it's education or any other um, application that, because I have been working with quite a few other uh, areas also besides education, the challenge is the volume of data. I'm like, it's massive. Um, and education, like uh, it has been, um, it's not that we have to start the automation or digitization right now. It has been there for decades. Uh, they were very selective of, they had gone for mainframe for that reason only. And they were uh, modernization, they uh, moved to Oracle. And right now is the right time they are moving to something else. You know, they, they are trying to move to cloud, but they're hesitant to even move data to the cloud. Mm -hmm. So the, the challenge is really the volume of data. Uh, a lot of uh, solutions which are there, um, it's, it's very enticing to go and implement it, but a lot of them do fail, you know, when massive, I'm like, we are not talking here of one or two millions, it's millions and millions of yeah. rows. Um, so that's a volume is the main challenge, and uh, I would add to security. Uh, at least in California, I've seen they are very concerned about the security of their data. Um, they might delay other things; they might not upgrade, uh, but they are very sensitive with the PIA data involved. So security is number one. Yeah, absolutely. So Martin, uh, as an architect, right? So in general, what are the key technology advancements uh, you believe are essential for future higher education? And how these technologies improve students' engagement and learning outcomes? So as an integration architect, I really want the technology to be completely invisible. Um, my primary focus is on the student experience or the staff experience, so to get data and only the data that's needed to the right system, to the right people, mm. um, as, as quickly and as easily as possible. So, yeah, I think, I mean, what we've got with, with WSO2, um, having an integration layer where we can just move, move the data around um, in as close to real time as possible, 
that's, that's been a big advantage. Interesting. Yeah. Right. right. So Christopher, um, from your perspective, what role does technology play in stream, uh, uh, streamline administrative and academic process in higher education? So uh, first, with DeVry uh, University, we're a university that serves a, sort of a non-traditional population. Uh, I think the technologies that we need as a primarily online delivery university mm -hmm. include um, you know, sort of online streaming and, and the learning uh, systems have to support that online learning. But I think technology-wise, what we're looking at, and I, I, I also took took to heart the comment that Sanjeeva made, which is that the digital experience is actually a, our competitive advantage, Yeah. right? So the way we present uh, ourselves and our capabilities to students, it's all online. It's for 90 plus percent of our students. And so leveraging technologies like artificial intelligence, predictive analytics so that we can understand what our students need and when they need it, mm -hmm. even before maybe they might seek out help so that we can um, move forward with those technologies. All those types of things are gonna be really important for our future. Absolutely. Right, so let's focus a little bit around the digital transition, right? So my next question to Lek. So how is NYU leveraging new technologies like, you know, the buzzword is AI, AI right? And to enhance information security and the privacy in the education sector, and what impact do you foresee these technologies having in the future of education? Sure. So we, we are uh, not really leveraging AI just yet, I think, in security and identity space much, except what's provided, and, and we're, you know, as part of the vendors. But I could imagine that we could utilize it quite, quite a bit in, you know, anomaly detection, threat detection, mm -hmm. any, any other types of areas where um, human work just takes quite a bit of time and we are dealing with spreadsheets right now, exporting data and trying to write some kind of processes to manipulate that data. So I think the AI could be quite helpful right there. Even um, in the area where, where we talked about MFA, where we're looking at, um, earlier there was a discussion uh, when you're, um, when somebody is uh, logging in from London and at the same time they're logging in, you know, um, across the globe from Hong Kong, and, and you can, you can, if we can detect these things, right, and, and bring them up and, and maybe silence or mute or somehow um, pause the, the individual for some additional verification. Um, so that, that, is, uh, that is for security. From education, I think we are uh, starting um, quite a, to be honest, uh, I have worked on what the early versions of, I would say, AI were in the 90s even, in my undergraduate, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that is just uh, logic and, and uh, data and uh, util re utilizing that logic with, um, and the rules around the data. Um, so in education itself and teaching, learning, and research, there's quite a bit uh, of that that is going on, but in it is, like I said earlier, you know, security and identity, it's, it's quite be behind, especially in the education yeah. sector. Yeah. So yeah. we're looking forward to moving, moving fast, at a faster pace. All right, right. So Sanjay, my question, yep. the next question for you. So uh, what are the main challenges and opportunities uh, you see in the integration technologies into the public education systems? So I'm like, oh. One of the biggest challenges that I see is when you start from scratch, when it's not automated, it's really easier to adapt to any technology. The problem is, uh, especially uh, I'm talking about more for California because that's where I've been working. Uh, they have gone through multiple uh, levels of uh, modernization. Uh, I'm like, they had automated quite some time back. So whenever you, you try to move something, you know, like say for example, recently, uh, a few years back, we moved to a microservice architecture and we implemented, uh, I mean, we were planning to take the database also, we had to cut short that. Um, we implemented the stacks, included WSO2 also. The problem was the user base had already seen, you know, the functionality. They know like what to expect. So unless we, 
uh, implement it really properly with especially the performance point of view. I, I'm giving you a small example, a user trying to log in and if he sees uh, he is getting a response slowly or uh, some other agency is trying to uh, execute an API, the response is l slow, uh, that triggers a lot of noise. Okay. So I see that as a major challenge, um, especially when you are trying to uh, move ahead. All right. Technology. So, right. Thank you. Martin, uh, what strategies are being employed to ensure these technologies are accessible and effective for all students? So a lot of our, uh, we're using a lot of third party mm -hmm. applications. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's all about if I take the student experience, our student record system has, we've got uh, listeners on that, like listening for changes. So as soon as there's a change to their record, we're able to propagate that um, as quickly. Like we can send that, from, I mean, from the moment they, they apply to the university all the way through to the point where they choose their courses. Um, this information is sent to the uh, query management system, it's sent to the timetabling system. Um, it's sent to finance for the billing, and I guess from the student's point of view, like the minute they they are in touch with the university and they make a change, they see the result of that. Mm -hmm. So the experience for them, it's like it just becomes seamless. All right. Yeah. So it's it's less about the systems that we're using and more about how how quickly we can get that information out to them. Um, All right. Yeah. All right. So Chris, and now let's talk about a little bit about uh, DevRai University. So how is the IT department utilizing new technologies to streamline, streamline uh, the identity management and integration process? And what benefit, benefits uh, have these technologies brought to administrative academic operations? Uh, so as far as um, identity, uh, we do um, use some different third-party uh, softwares, but for integration, where we're working with WSO2, it's definitely streamlined processes. I think um, looking at the evolution for Ohio State that Glenn was talking about, where now under his purview is also data engineering, I think it's really important mm -hmm. that we've made investments in data management making sure that we're not just collecting and passing information back and forth, but we're developing information out of that data that's uh, being moved throughout our integrations. And then that we can present back to say, just as, as our academics, um, you, you asked about academics, so as I mentioned before, predictive analytics, integrating what we learn about students at the micro level, individual students, not just how are we performing in terms of maybe the grades of our students in particular programs, but getting down to the micro level of um, uh, understanding who our student is, how they're doing, we actually can turn that around and integrate back out to a tutoring program through a chat bot that reaches out to the student you know, before a human being does, start to see if they wanna pursue that tutoring, and then we can leave more, um, uh, more high-level problem solving to the actual subject matter experts, say, in academics, um, you know, financially, whatever the department might be. So leveraging these technologies, um, integration being key to all that, and then the data management, and then how do you do that reach out? Um, we've started to do all of those things and bring them together. Right, right. So, Lake, my next question is now, let's focus around now how to, how the WSO2 technology is helping out all these improvements, right? So how WSU platform uh, impacted, impact basically in the security and the operational efficiency of educational data management at NYU? Sure, so we are utilizing WSO2 identity server. Yeah. Um, uh, as part of that, uh, mainly single sign-on, uh, it enabled us to provide OpenID Connect, OAuth2 authentication. Um, mainly beyond web web based, uh, it provided us with uh, mobile um, authentication, and uh, we were leveraging it for APIs. Actually, quite a quite a few APIs, and so that that that, that is predominantly how we're using it. Now, in terms of efficiencies and savings, um, WSO2 because we we have prof professional services and uh, managed services, I guess it's in uh, in our private cloud. 
we're able to leverage WSO2 uh, for patching, for security, for any updates, upgrades, all those things, administrative things, technical things that we don't want to focus on um, as IT for the, for the university. What we really want to focus on is providing um, you know, solutions for our different units, mm -hmm. uh, for our key stakeholders and uh, or our community. Uh, for example, implementing or adding new application to single sign-on or adding attributes or claims um, and, and leveraging those claims as part of role management in, in any other ways. Okay. Uh, such that the, the user experience and the security can be enhanced. Um, so so WSC2 is really uh, taking quite a bit of the administrative work away from us. All right, good to see. Um, Sanjay, yeah. so going in the same uh, subject, like. Can you explain how uh, WSO2 Identity Access Management, I know it's, it, it, it plays a big part in yes. one of the projects, right? So can you explain that, how AIM and API management products utilized, utilized in supporting the complex application uh, for various student grant programs in California? Yeah, so <clears throat> what happened is WSO2 became very important uh, for California, uh, for Student Aid Commission once we, modernized from a .NET environment where the identity and access management was done um, like in the, in the uh, system, in, the, uh, in .NET code. When we moved to microservice architecture, one of the first need we, we felt was, okay, we need to have a separate IAM. And because uh, we had uh, totally rewritten the UI uh, using Angular, uh, there were a lot of API calls going through. Uh, we have a Java stack also, like through which it goes. Which and because our database is on premise, we needed an API manager also. Uh, cost was a big concern. That's where uh, WSO2 really played a big role. So we have implemented IAM uh, uh, products and your API manager That's projects. And uh, all our APIs, they are being hosted in the WSO2 API manager. And everything we are having in cloud, the good thing is, you know, we have been able to, uh, we, ha we are on the AWS, so we, de we get these images uh, which we deploy as uh, containers uh, as, uh, in, in the stack. Uh, that has been a big help, you know, at least we don't have to worry about the, I the identity manager. I'm like, whether a student is logging or some university is logging into our system, WSO2 IM is taking care. All right, great to see. Uh, Martin, um, how does WSO2 platform facilitate uh, the integration of various education tools and systems? So I think a good example here might be something like our lecture recording system. So um, we're able to read timetables, and compare them with, look at what lectures are being held in what rooms and what, what uh, recording facilities that room might have. And we're able to automatically like record lectures oh. um, without the, the lecturer having to be involved at all. Um, and all that's kind of just uploaded to the cloud to make all that content available to the students uh, in their own time. So if they missed a lecture or if they want to replay a lecture, um, it's all handled automatically. Um, I think that's, I think that's a great use of technology and removing a technical, you know, barrier for the, uh, you know, because some staff they just want to teach. They don't want to be involved in like which button do I need to press. It's all handled for them. Yeah, I think that's a, that's that's a big win. Interesting, yeah. interesting. So Chris, I know that uh, the API management part tool plays a big role in your university. So uh, can you, could you elaborate uh, any, on any specific instance where it enhances your, uh, enhance the ability to manage uh, the integration process effectively? Sure, so I like simple examples, and the simple example for this for API manager is the fact that even at the lowest level at, at sort of authentication between systems internally or externally, we have a tool that allows us to do that it's a default authentication method, but we can set things up uh, based on the, the need, the consumer for, for the integration in a very simple way, in a very manageable way where we have a sort of a, a single view of that for management. The other would be when it comes to um, actual integrations, 
we have in, you know in your integration studio where we have sort of a, a low code approach to building the baseline uh, control of artifacts and sort of a skeleton of things. So our developers don't have to worry about that. They just have to go ahead and and develop their code, and it gives them some flexibility to move away from, from some of those. Um, I don't mean that they're less important, but low level from the developer's point of view um, functions that have to happen so that they can focus more on the business logic and things that have to happen. Interesting, interesting. So let's focus the future, right? And my question is to Rick. How is NYU IT preparing for education predicted, uh, educa uh, predicted shift in education technology over the next, next decade, uh, particularly in terms of enhancing information security? Sure. Um, so one, one big step is, I think, leveraging uh, partnerships with, uh, in private and public sector, uh, working with other institutions, creating standards, best practices, and, and really um, just um, educating not, not just our community, but educating ourselves of what's, what's coming and, and how can we uh, get ahead of it. Um, one example of that would be the, the conversation that was earlier about quantum. Yeah. Right, and then that's coming. And what are we doing to prepare our um, encryption levels, our security, our passwords, and how can we um, prepare that ahead of time so that when quantum computing does come, we're not in behind. Uh, especially in education, as I men mentioned, we um, we always try to, you know, focus on other areas, and we haven't really focused too much on security. But I think this is the time to focus on it, and this is the time to make investments. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So Sanjay, yeah. so uh, what key strategies uh, do you recommend for public sector education institutes uh, to effectively prepare for future technological advancements? So I, I will talk in general, not just California, but entire, like uh, the first thing I would recommend is uh, security. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, we had heavily invested on APIs. Uh, data moving across agencies. And the first thing which we said, okay, you are moving all these data, having, uh, which includes PIA data, how, how do we uh, make sure it's really secure? We introduced a concept called uh, encryption of uh, data in transit. Uh, it was a lot of effort to do that, but uh, besides the regular token and other uh, security mechanism, encryption really helped. So bottom line, security will be one of the key components, uh, no matter uh, which state or which institution goes for it. Um, and like the way I'm seeing in the education sector, the data is growing drastically. Uh, also because it is being shared across different institutions, so that's, I'm seeing a lot of growth happening in that. So better invest in a good data management system. Yeah. Uh, I'm like, I'm not pinpointing any particular product, but I anybody who's going with a particular DBMS, make sure that it can handle the load. Thank you. So Martin, um, how are you integrating emerging technologies to future proof of education and env environments uh, against rapid change in the education landscape? So I mentioned before about uh, lecture recording and yeah. getting content online. Um, I think in, in these days, you know, like more and more content is moving online and that digital experience is, uh, it's a key driver. But I don't want to forget that actually, you know, we're universities, we're campus based. And I think ultimately what this needs to lead to is that people have got access to the content at any point but when they come together on campus, it should be about maximizing their time together. So they've, they've got all the content you know, at any point. When they get together, it's like, okay, now we can apply it, now we can talk about it, now we can interact. And I think it's providing tools where they can uh, make the most of that, that time on campus uh, and then follow that through with you know, discussions afterwards. All right, Yeah. great. So Christopher. Uh, what preparations uh, in Devra University making to adapt its IT infrastructure to support the future trends in education, such as increased online learning and data-driven decision making? Mm -hmm. So as far as uh, purely talking infrastructure, 
we are just about to complete uh, a move entirely to the cloud. So getting out of managing data centers on our own, it, 100%. Um, the reason for that, uh, some are very obvious, I'm sure, to everyone in the room, but uh, scalability, being able to burst. Uh, we, we are primarily an online learning university, so we, we already live in that world, and we have to support spikes in uh, users within our learning systems. Um, and so we never know exactly when that's gonna happen because we're not following a traditional schedule where someone has to show up at a classroom at one time. It, it's uh, streamed, it's recorded. And so, I mean, that's, that's just one example. Uh, on the other side, we have made this investment and continue to make an investment in data management okay. and also in AI technologies. So the student ultimately is, is our consumer. It's, the, it's who we have to serve. We have uh, chat bots that are you know, popping up in every part of our organization <laughs> internally um, and external facing as well. So um, we really gotta try and uh, manage that better probably, uh, to be honest. Um, have some sort of a governance and focus in that area because the world's going that way yeah. and we need to prepare ourselves internally and help prepare our students. We, we've built AI labs actually so that students can be exposed to this uh, very early on and, and through programs that we offer. But we want to make sure that we prepare our students and ourselves for the AI enabled future that is really here now and, and only going to grow in the future. So. All right. All right, gentlemen, that's all the question I have. Okay. Thanks, gentlemen, again. It's a very insightful uh, panel discussion. And yeah, looking forward to work with you all. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.